The Center for Migration Studies of New York commissioned over 20 papers on different aspects of the refugee protection system by leading scholars for a CMS conference and special collection of the Journal on Migration and Human Security entitled Rethinking the Global Refugee Protection System. In this video, Susan Martin, Donald G. Herzberg Professor Emeritus in International Migration at Georgetown University discusses outcomes of the July conference, as well as her paper, New Models of International Agreement for Refugee Protection. The reason it's really important to focus on um, internally displaced persons, or IDPs as they're usually called in the field, um, is first of all, um, they're often in the most vulnerable situations because they are in effect going from the um, fire maybe into a fi frying pan that's right on top of the fire. They're not getting very far away from where the danger is. Um, and it's very hard to reach them. It's very hard to protect them, to provide assistance. Um, the second reason that we need to really think seriously about IDPs um, is that they're the majority of those who are displaced by conflict and also by natural disasters and other life-threatening situations. Um, and of course, that doesn't mean that refugees aren't important, that they're not vulnerable, um, that we shouldn't be caring about them. Um, but it's also important to make sure that just because somebody is displaced within their own country, uh, that we don't ignore their situation. Um, unfortunately, in too many places around the world, um, the international community is ignoring the IDPs. Um, take Syria for an example. Um, there are about four to five million Syrian refugees. Um, most of whom are in neighboring countries. Um, and there's somewhere between six and eight million um, internally displaced. Um, if you look at the budget, um, almost all of the funding from the UN High Commissioner for Refugees in, and from donors are going to the refugees, um, but very little funding, um, very little aid is getting to the internally displaced. Um, and again, it's not that one group is more deserving of the other, um, but it's really quite disturbing when there is a group that's so vulnerable um, and yet out of reach by the international community and not enough is being done to try to redress that situation. I think the main takeaways from the conference um, with regard to where we move forward in terms of protection of refugees, and I'll talk, use the term refugee broadly to talk about all displaced persons who are in need of protection. Um, the first thing that needs to be done is that there's an upcoming summit um, in September, um, and actually two summits, one at the UN and um, one that President Obama is hosting. And it's important that the ideas that come out of those summits, um, the compacts for responsibility sharing on refugees, one on safe and orderly migration, hopefully those compacts will survive the political process. Um, but assuming they survive, it's important that uh, they be fleshed out in a way that makes them meaningful um, and makes them implementable. Is we need to have more than nice words. We have to have real actions. That's first thing. Um, second thing is that I think we have made some progress in filling some of the protection gaps for IDPs, um, for um, people who are fleeing natural disasters, um, non-nationals of countries that are caught in um, in crisis situations, conflict, natural disasters. Now we've made some progress in developing guidelines, de developing um, more agreement or consensus on what we need to do about those populations. Now, again, we have to implement those guidelines and make sure that we actually are, are, um, are taking the actions that are necessary to protect them.
Um, and then a third area is that for many, many years there's been a real gap between the humanitarian community and the development community. Today we can't afford that um, because, first of all, most refugees in urban areas, they're mixing with local host populations, many of whom are the poorest in their countries. Um, we need to have coordinated actions um, on behalf of the humanitarian community and the development community to make sure that both groups, the refugees, or internally displaced persons, and the local host populations are able to do better. That are they're neither group is living in poverty, neither group is, is under uh, under threat in terms of their own lives. Um, and we can't do that unless we really work on humanitarian and development issues together. Um, and so for an action agenda, I think we need to really be putting emphasis on identifying what have been the barriers to successful collaboration between the two communities um, and what do we need to do to overcome those barriers. The fourth thing that we need to do is to invigorate, reinvigorate the kind of work that the MacArthur Foundation that funded this conference um, and other f foundations have done over the years um, to strengthen the evidence base for decision making on, um, on refugee issues, on um, other types of migration issues, um, and to have the kind of support from the philanthropic community um, that only they can really do in supporting the kinds of activities that are necessary to follow up on the ideas that came out of this, uh, this conference and will likely come out of the UN summits. Yeah, I think the major thing that policymakers and also, frankly, the, the general public um, misunderstand is that, number one, we're not in a refugee crisis as defined by the number of refugees. We've had this number of refugees previously, um, and we had challenges, but we succeeded in protecting people. Um, Today, what I think we have is really a failure of governance. Um, and that's what the policymakers should be focusing on. Um, what can they be doing to make sure that the responses to refugees um, are able to provide as much protection as is needed for the refugees, as much help to the local communities that will have a hard time absorbing people? Um, and have legitimate concerns. Um, but those concerns can be addressed. Um, this is particularly true in the wealthy countries. Um, I think most of the public in the United States um, would be terribly upset if they actually realized that a country like Lebanon, which has four million people living in it, has hosted more than one million Syrian refugees, where we are debating accepting 10,000. Um, to think that our great nation is doing less than the poor nations around the world who are hosting so many more refugees, um, I think would be a shock to those to the public, and I think it would be a shock actually to the um, policymakers who really haven't looked very deeply at what the situation is worldwide um, and what we have as a country have done before. When we've rejected refugees, as happened in the 1930s, um, unfortunately a lot of people went to their death. Um, and now after the Holocaust, you know, the U.S. and other countries said never again, we're not going to leave refugees um, to, uh, to perish um, when we can do something to save their lives. Um, and we you know, policymakers have to continually relearn that lesson um, because it's very easy to turn your backs on refugees um, and then be shocked, you know, as the um, captain in Casablanca was, um, when in fact the result of that is something you know, way worse than you ever thought it would be.
Okay. My, a lot of my research interest now, as it's been for a long time, um, has been to identify gaps in protection for um, refugees, but also for other displaced persons. Um, and I'm interested in working on what are the policy gaps, um, but also what are the mechanisms that we can put in place in order to fill those gaps. Um, I've never been satisfied with describing a problem without working seriously at trying to find the solution. Um, and I think that a lot of academics don't necessarily feel that they have an obligation to try to find the solutions, but because I've been in and out of government, um, I've you know, come to understand that it's not particularly helpful or wasn't helpful to me as a policymaker um, to be told where things are going wrong unless there are some alternatives. Um, so I'm going to, I will continue to work um, in that area. Um, another area that um, takes a lot of my time um, is trying to think about whether there's a better way that we can use new technologies, um, the new big data, to be able to forecast mass movements of people well ahead of time. Um, not to stop the movements from happening, um, but to provide alternatives for people and to provide better emergency responses. Um, there's no reason in today's day and age that we should be surprised when there's large-scale movements of people. Um, we should be able to pick up the early warning signs um, and then put into place um, ways of averting some of the movements, make sure that people ha don't have to take dangerous modes of, of travel in order to reach safety, but try to bring them out in a way that gets them to safety um, and gets them to places which can, can respond more humanely. Um, and then if an emergency happens to have the food preposition, the supplies pre uh, prepositioned, uh, to have the staff on call, to be able to get in there much, much more rapidly uh, than is the case today. So trying to develop an early warning system for mass displacement um, is an area of particular interest to me.